let's see. So we do have our uh, our uh, the, the sponsor of our, our sole sponsor of uh, DDD Dallas right now is Afterman Software, um, of whom I uh, I work for. Just a full disclosure, um, and kind of what we uh, one of the things that we uh, uh, focus on or uh, specialize in is uh, domain driven design training and domain decomposition. Oops. So helping uh, a lot of what we do is helping clients take legacy systems and, uh, and kind of go through those and, uh, and redesign them using domain driven design methodologies. Um, so if you're interested, uh, we've got, uh, free consultation for two hours and you can email us a uh, call or visit our website to learn more. Um, also we're trying something new. Uh, if you want to, uh, so we, we were planning on doing a bunch of, uh, conferences and whatnot this year and bought a bunch of stuff. We've got like t-shirts and mugs and pens. So if anybody wants some free swag, just email us and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get something sent out to you. Okay. So that's what I got. I guess without further ado, uh, our speaker for tonight, a man whom I believe needs no introduction, uh, Jimmy Bogard. Thanks, Jason. Um, let me share my screen because I just did one of these last week and I went seven to eight minutes without sharing my screen. It was rather embarrassing. So let's do nice. that. All right, can everyone see it okay? Yep. Okay. Oh, can nice. I mention, sorry. Yes. Um, we talked, I talked, uh, we talked about the uh, questions. Any questions anybody has, just uh, put them in the chat and we will get to them at the end. All right, um, so yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, my name is Jimmy Bogard. Um, you can find me on Twitter at, at jbogard. Uh, you can find me on GitHub. So this presentation, um, and every presentation I do is on my GitHub. So github.com slash jbogard. There's a presentations repository there, and it's all there. Uh, and I blog about this topic and a lot of others at my blog at jimmybogard.com. Uh, I received an MVP award for, I don't know reasons why, they don't tell you why, but I get it and I take it, so here we are. Um, and I work with an um, independent, independent consultant out of Austin, Texas. Uh, and I also uh, work for another consulting company here in town called Headspring as their chief architect. Um, I do a lot of open source stuff, so all those projects on the right are just things that I've been able to pull out of my projects, uh, my day job. Um, so for a lot of my career, um, I didn't really have to care about any of the stuff we had to talk about today. Um, and those are good times because those are simpler times. Um, I just built just kind of like every, you know, just single applications where everything was in process, just a web app that talked to a database. And, and I just, that was pretty much it. I have to worry about my application talking to other applications. Um, but uh, soon after I actually started Headspring, I had to start building systems that had to talk to other systems. And I had to figure out, well, how should these systems talk to each other? And so it took a long time for me to, one, just figure out like what are the different ways for systems to be able to talk to each other. That was like first thing. Um, and the second thing was, well, then how should these different systems and service, uh, services communicate with each other? And so um, a lot of the mistakes I made early on in building systems uh, that needed to communicate with each other, um, a lot of it just came down to me not having the right vocabulary and design thinking uh, when I was trying to architect these systems. Um, I would uh, make systems talk to each other that really wouldn't make sense. And so a lot of this presentation today is trying to come up with some metaphors and ideas about how we design systems to talk to each other so that when we actually you know, get code written, that uh, the system does, doesn't just fall flat in its face. Um, so first, before we get too much further, I did want to uh, at least try to define what I mean by a microservice, um, because it's kind of an overloaded term and doesn't have a lot of concrete definition. Uh, in the original book, for example, it just says 
what is microservice? It's small and does one thing well. Okay, well that's horribly imprecise, like small, what does that mean? Um, there's no guidance whatsoever, it's just like, well, just not big. Um, so what, is, what does that mean? Um, and in, in fact, uh, a couple years ago, there was a, there's a survey of the industry that's like, okay, you know, raise your hand if you're doing microservices. Okay, well, how, you know, how big is your normal microservice? And there was something like five orders of magnitude difference between what people said their, their ideal microservice was, like between 10 lines of code and like 100,000. <laughs> so order like the sizes of people's quote microservices. So yeah, no one agrees what small means. And there's two pieces. It's small and does one thing and it does it well. So well, you know, what is one thing? Is it is it one function? Um, one story point of work, uh, one one endpoint for an API? Uh, what you what is what could that possibly mean? And then it does it well. Well, that's that's the, also completely subjective. Um, so I didn't like those terms. I couldn't really, you know. Everyone was. Everyone could say they're doing it. Everyone could say they, you know, everyone else wasn't doing it. Um, so I tried to come up with something that made more sense to me, or at least when I was trying to explain to my clients. Um, so I define microservices as a service-oriented architecture. So this is like so a done right gorilla s away from like the service-oriented architecture. Didn't was was taken over by the uh, vendors. They're trying to sell you these big central brokers and stuff. So microservices was largely a um, is largely a reaction to that. Um, to uh, against these like you know big central brokers and things like that, but there were a lot of good things from service-oriented architecture, and a lot of the patterns we'll be talking about today actually didn't come out of microservices. They're much much older than that, and a lot of them were really expanded upon in service-oriented architecture. So for me, this was um, a bit of better definition because services and SOA land actually do have a very big, uh, well like very precise uh, definition. So that's what I thought they were. It's like it's a service-oriented architecture but it's one in which we are striving for the smallest still autonomous boundary. And that keyword there is autonomous because a lot, I see a lot of people making mistakes when they're building microservice oriented architectures. I'm just trying to make, thing, make, make deployable components as small as possible. And then suddenly you have this architecture we have, oh God, it's those, those like circle diagrams with all the dependencies and like you have a thousand lines going everywhere. Um, and someone's really proud of it when they put it out there and everyone else is like recoiling in horror. Oh my God, there's all these different dependencies. Um, so our goal is not to just make components as small as possible. Uh, it's really to make them as small as possible, but still retaining their autonomy. And what I mean by autonomy is that, um, you know, they, they own their own business. So they, <laughs> they own their own data. They own the contracts of how people talk to them. They own the, uh, the only uptime and availability of getting that information in and out. Um, they own all the business functionality associated with that information. Um, and then finally, they own the security associated with it. So they decide who can get in or out. Um, so if you have all those different properties, you, you could say, well, you're, you're autonomous. You may not be able to stand up purely on your own, but at least you're in charge of your own stuff. So I looked at this definition and, and other messaging patterns in play. And I noticed that when people were really screwing up these kinds of architectures, um, it's because the things that they had des designed ignored a lot of the fallacies of distributed computing. Um, the two that really strike, uh, strike us are, are the, one, the one that's like the latency is zero. The time to communicate between service is zero. And that's something that's super easy to assume when everything is developed on localhost because I'm not crossing any network boundaries. But if I, at the very beginning of my project, and I'm starting to figure out you know, what my service boundaries are, if I design my system in terms of metaphors that make those latencies more real and more obvious, then I'm much more likely to have a solution in the end that can actually perform and function and make sense to both the end user and, and the business. So I want to look a lot at how do, how do real world systems solve these very real problems of autonomy and independent act activities, uh, but still be able to accomplish some larger business goal. So if I look at messaging in real life, like how, how humans are actually able to uh, perform complex business tasks and functions, although it can be messy, right? Yeah. Um, they're still be able to perform complex business operations, um, but still have a lot of autonomy and independence. So if I look at the kinds of things that, that companies have done in the past to scale up their, their operations, um, to be able to optimize what they're doing, it's a very similar kind of operation that we see in online um, 
kind of web scale kind of uh, applications and systems as well. So the kinds of problems that like catalogs from a hundred years ago, those are the same kinds of problems that Amazon has to, has to address. The only difference is that latency in Amazon is much shorter. So I'm dealing with response times in the milliseconds as opposed to mailing a catalog out in which latency from me printing to delivery um, could be a week um, or whatever. Um, the same thing with like fast food and things like that. Like they've, they've optimized their operations to move and scale past this kind of everything is done by one person to be able to be more efficient and more effective and how they're able to conduct business. So I, um, <laughs> I am out of Austin and which is just like, you know, slightly more hipster uh, than Dallas, although, you know, certain parts of Dallas are catching up, I guess. Um, <laughs> that's in the deep elm, I guess, is, is pretty nice too. And uh, one of the things that we have a lot in, Dallas, in Austin are food trucks. Um, in fact, my office, before everything was shut down, would have a food truck like every single day of the week. Um, and those food trucks were always like, you know, like some clever name and some, you know, fusion of two different, uh, different cuisines. And, uh, you know, it was always something interesting to go out, go down and get something to eat. So I looked at that operation and saw that the way a lot of those food trucks operate is very, very similar to how I built a lot of systems early in my career. So in this kind of like very simplified view of a, of a food truck operation, um, everything is done by a single person. Uh, one of my favorites that I have that, that uh, is down there is, this, is, a, is a hot dog cart. But hot dogs are, you know, just boring by themselves. So he makes it a bit interesting. So his his take on things is he makes bacon wrapped hot dogs that are then deep fried. So they are absolutely amazing, uh, just ridiculous. Um, but it's just one guy. He's like one guy does absolutely every single job. So that means that every single transaction is 100% synchronous, and everything is like quote in process. So he does absolutely everything within the context of you standing there right in front of them and no other, um, no other request to get processed, no other customer can be processed until he has completed that entire order. So this actually sounded very familiar to a lot of the original systems and applications that built in which everything was, was basically done inside one single application host and process. You make a request to get some information, um, you as the requester were blocked um, from really doing anything else and uh, that thread was blocked while I was doing all this work and coming back and actually serving you the information. So um, I saw a lot, of, a lot of parallels between those like very simple interior kind of applications and um, this one person food truck. So if you are, if you're crazy enough and you wanna say, I, you know, I wanna start a food truck business, um, it's, even though it's extremely risky, uh, probably not a good idea right now either. Um, you have to figure out what your business model is. And your business model is based on one, like how much money can you take in at a given point, you know, a given period of time? And how many orders can you process within that given period of time? Because that's, that's how much money you can actually make. So the business model um, needs to figure out how many orders can I, can I process in a given amount of time? And so what this person can do is just divide out, like well, what does the normal order look like? And how long does it take to complete each individual step? Because it's only one person doing every single job, my throughput is really just how long it takes me to do one order, uh, divided out by how much time I expect to be sitting there operating my food truck. So in this case, and I completely made up these numbers, I have four steps. I take your order, I address your order, I put uh, the order on the grill, um, then I pack the order up in a bag, and I hand it to you, um, and each of those all put together takes about two and a half minutes, which means if I divide that out over the course of an hour, that should be um, a maximum of 24 orders per hour. So I could do the math, say, well, 24 orders per hour, um, this is my break even amount, so this is how much I need to charge. Well, we'll go down a little bit, say maybe it's just a max of like 20 orders an hour, you know, just to be safe here. Um, but when they, when they got, quote, go to production, what they find is they never get close to that maximum number of orders per hour. And why is that? Well, it turns out that real life is much messier than this kind of very simple formulaic view of the world. Um, so further complications to our business model. One is people don't like to wait in lines. Um, if someone comes in and sees a long line, then you walk away. Well, the other thing we notice is there's not a constant rate of flow at 
that is not one person coming every two and a half minutes. And in fact, it's like humans are, are kind of weird creatures of habit. So when you go out to lunch, you don't be like, oh, it's 12.07, that means it's lunchtime. People tend to go out to lunch at very specific times of the day, like on the hour, the quarter hour, the half hour. They don't just walk out at random times. And in an office complex, <coughs> uh, what we'll often do is go on Slack and be like, all right, I'm heading down to the food truck. And so once you see like one person going down, it'll be five people going down because you know we get to go down together and talk whatever while we're waiting. Um, so even though I could have this theoretical max of X many orders per hour, that does not mean that someone arrives every uh, so many minutes based on that calculation. They come in waves coming down like that. And if someone comes down, and I've had that, you know, I had this happen many times, I come down, I see the, the, the deep fried bacon wrapped hot dog food truck with a line of like 10 people long. And I'm like, oh gosh, he's backed up again. What's going on here? And this poor guy, he sees me looking with his you know, dejected look on my face and knows like, well, that person sees this long line. He knows it's gonna be a long wait and he's not gonna wait. So that person that sees that long line is just going to keep on walking and then you know, order from Jimmy John's or whatever because that's much faster. So that's money they just lost. And you see this in the online world as well. Like Amazon had this famous paper in which they, they calculated how much revenue they lost based on every X milliseconds. I think it was like every 100 milliseconds, they lose a million dollars or something like that. Uh, this is years and years ago, so it's probably even higher than that, with even lower latencies. And we see that like for, if a website is slow um, and it's consistently slow, we'll go somewhere else to find somewhere else to shop because you know, everyone sells the same stuff these days. Um, so you can just find somewhere, someone else that sells it and have a quicker experience. So in this business model, what I really want to optimize on is the number of orders I can take per hour. If I can take more orders, that means I'm going to get more money and everyone's going to be happy. So what's our options here? How can we scale up this? Everything is, is in one step, one process. Well, I could just like scale up my operation. That is, why don't I just make my food truck bigger? Like, I can I can do more things with a bigger with a bigger food truck, but that's not really how it works in practice because I can't just easily up the size of my food truck. I can't double the number of food food trucks either. Um, if I look at my operations, though, I can see that just even doing those those things. Let's say I have just two food trucks, that won't necessarily double my throughput because I have a complex set of steps in the background that needs to happen in order to fulfill each individual order. So what do places actually do to up their throughput? How do they how do they make more money? They don't make them bigger. They don't make, well, I guess they can make more of them, but not in the same location. Um, instead, what they do is they hire more workers. It's like, let's let's split this, the work into individual steps and have each person just do one step of that job. Now, the interesting thing that happens is when I specialize each of the jobs to do one individual thing, then each of, those op each of those people doing those jobs can optimize their own individual work, which means that some steps can actually optimize and even start to do things, uh, do more things in parallel. For example, I could buy a bigger grill or a fryer or whatever and say, you know, instead of me doing one hot dog at a time, if I see a group of 10 people walking up, how about I just drop 10 hot dogs and now they're good to go or drop, drop five and five, like, a, you know, five ready to go now. And then after a certain amount of time, the other five will be done as well. But now that grill person can make that decision on, the, on their own because they're not spending their, any of their time doing any of the other, other steps of the process. So at this point, with all these other steps in the kind of the background to fulfill the order, now ordering is the only real bottleneck in me getting money. And what I mean by that is um, when you go up to the order counter of any, uh, step, you know, any place like this, um, you place your order, you tell them what you want, and then you give them money and then your transaction is done. So their theoretical max of number of orders per hour is how many people can order and give you money in a given period of time. We can optimize the back end uh, in a different way, but now my maximum number of orders per hour is really limited by just how quickly people can come in and place their order. So I made up the number before that was like, what, 30 seconds per order to order and, and take your money. So now my theoretical max goes up by almost an order of magnitude. I went from like 20 to 24 orders per hour to 120. And now this time, I'm much more, um, it's much more feasible for me to actually hit that maximum 
because that's a very simple synchronous operation to be able to take your order and get your money. So yes, let's just do this. Let's just you know, take your money and uh, you know, everyone's in the background. Um, so I do watch uh, reality shows from time to time and some of my favorites are the ones where <laughs> Uh, either Gordon Ramsay or the uh, the bar rescue guy, I forget the guy's name, um, mainly because they get really angry and their face gets red. And in those shows, they take these like really broken restaurants and then try to fix them. And inevitably what we see besides like, I guess bar rescue a lot of times, like the bartender is like stealing drinks. Uh, so excluding that, a lot of times it's just process problems. They're not communicating well. They're not organizing their work well. Not everyone knows what they're doing and who's doing which job. And so what they do in those shows is like, be very explicit about who does what job. How do p different people communicate with each other? What is the overall process of an order? And once they get down, the things can, be can become a lot more efficient. So that's our challenge here, is to determine how do we fulfill an order? Some of the things we'll see is, one, the transaction is no longer synchronous. So in the single person doing every single job, me as a customer coming up, like I just, order something and I stand there staring at that person waiting for them to do all the stuff and once they're done they give me the food and then I leave so it's a it's this it's this very strong contract like I'm not moving from this spot until you give me your food but in a case where the the order processing is hopping happening offline then I'm not standing at the cashier register while I'm waiting for food because you know they'll still yell like uh next up please next order please and they give you this like, you know, please get out of the way, um, go stand over there. Um, so in this case, um, I, don't, I don't stand there waiting for my stuff. I have to go stand to the side. So now we have to coordinate this activity of this order being fulfilled and finally make it to, making it to me. Well, okay, sure, just um, pass off the steps to other folks, but how do those later steps know what to do? And how do those later steps know when they're done? And the solution here is going to be communication patterns with messaging. So what I want to do is take each of these steps and figure out what is the, in the real world, like what is the, what is the actual communication pattern that they would use in real life and what makes those the most sense for each interaction. And depending on the overall business requirements, it may not be consistent about what kind of interaction we use for every single kind of communication. So let's look at that first one, me coming up and placing an order. So in that communication, I'm gonna need some information from the customer. I need to know what food you want. I need some way to know how to notify the customer that their order is ready. And uh, typically in this interaction, it's going to be a synchronous interaction. Um, the cashier and customer are blocked doing, during this interaction. And the reason why we wanna do that is um, we want to have as little overhead as possible in trying to take your order. We wanna make this as high degree of success um, and have low risk as possible for me taking your order and taking your money. The higher the probability of success for this interaction, the greater chance I get your money and the more money my company makes. So if I wanna have a very high um, possibility of success uh, and a very fast operation, I'm gonna try to do as little work as possible in this initial step. So really all I'm doing here is just hearing what you wanna order and telling you how much it's gonna cost. And I get your money and then it's done. So in this case, we would actually use a non-durable form of communication. That is, we're not writing anything down. The order is requested verbally because that has very low overhead. And because both the um, send and receiver are blocked, then there's not as much likelihood of, of you having to repeat your order or you lose the order because you weren't paying attention. You go up to the order, they're staring at you, you're staring at them. And so you know that like in all likelihood, you're going to be able to successfully place your order. <clears throat> so what does this look like in a virtual world? Um, if I was building systems, what would, it, what would a synchronous, non-durable form of communication look like? Well, that, the easiest way I can possibly think of doing that would be just HTTP. Um, HTTP, I, I post up an order saying, this is, the, uh, this is the stuff I want, and here's my name. And then they tell me, yep, I got your order, and Here's, here's a link to tell you where you can find your order details. So what patterns do we see here? It's a synchronous request response. I'm going to request some information or request you to do something, and I get a synchronous response back. So I'm blocked, I'm not doing anything, I'm staring at you, you're staring at me, 
and it's very low overhead. Nobody writes anything. Uh, I'm not writing down a communication and passing it over to the desk to you, and you writing it down and passing it back over to me. Nope, it's it's verbal. It's synchronous blocking. Um, so very uh, very low overhead and very quick to complete. Okay, so that's the easy part, right? What about these other steps? How do we manage the flow of information to these downstream steps? Um, should we use durable or non-durable communication? Who's going to manage the steps that need to happen for any one individual order? And how do we manage failures of each uh, of any individual step? So what about this first one? We could look at just doing what we did before and making a synchronous request response. So you make a post to an API or you make a post on a web form and that one form makes an API call out to something else. Now that API call is actually doing the work as well. So it's like, it has to acknowledge that I received something. But what happens when that uh, other side doesn't return back any response? So what if they say, okay, I want you to, I want you to start the work, but we don't hear anything. What would this look like in the real world? Well, in the real world, that person is busy doing something else. They're actually doing their job. So if I'm yelling at them like, hey, order's up, here's the order information. If they're listening because they're too busy doing other stuff, then what do I do? You know, they're busy. They're, they're, you know, they're doing the job they're telling them to do. And so they might just return back like, <laughs> sorry, service unavailable. Um, and now you got to do something else. So maybe they retry. Okay, let me go ahead and do that again. Okay, finally, yes, fine, I got it. Um, finally got a successful response, so everything is good, right? Well, maybe, maybe not, because um, now that the dress person says, yes, I got it, but what happens if uh, they actually did hear it that first time, and you told them twice, you just didn't wait long enough for them to respond to you, and so then now they think it's two orders versus one order. So we'd have to worry about, in the synchronous request response, we have to worry about making sure that if I tell them twice to do something, that they only do that uh, operation once. And you can see this happen in those reality shows. Like someone will say, I need a, you know, I, I need some fries. Um, and they didn't get the response back. So a minute later they say, hey, I need some fries. And then suddenly out comes two fries because they didn't know that you really just meant one. You were just repeating yourself from the previous order. Maybe that's okay. Maybe it's not, but it's something we have to worry about in real life and uh, the systems that we build as well. That's good. One other thing we can look at is perhaps some kind of fire and forget. That is, when I yell at the uh, yell at the older person, like go ahead and and process this order. Maybe they don't do that work right away. All they're doing is acknowledging that I received your information. It's like gotcha, thanks, um, but they're not actually going to do the work right away. So we can do this in web service world instead of returning back two hundred. Okay, like yep, I did the work. They could back accepted. I I got your request. I'm not going to do it right now. I'm going to write it down over here and you'll get it done sometime in the future. But if you look at um, kind of real restaurants about how they operate, you don't hear a bunch of yelling going on behind the scenes. And in fact, if you hear a bunch of yelling of people trying to you know, get stuff done, that should worry you because like something's gonna get forgotten, something's gonna get dropped. And when you get your food, you're probably gonna check that bag to make sure everything's okay. So in this scenario, I have a very simple process that needs to happen. I have me take the order, I need to dress the thing, I need to grill the thing, I pack the thing, and it's always in those series of steps. Um, and you can see this in restaurants that have very simplified menus, um, where it's a very linear operation from step to step to step to step. And in fact, there's a great, um, there was a great, I forget the name of the movie, but it was uh, <laughs> the movie with um, talking about the, the rise of McDonald's. Um, and how early on they were able to really optimize their process to be able to deliver food very, very quickly. And that was the thing, like getting the food very quickly. Now, the quality may not have been as good, but they definitely got your food very, very fast. Uh, and so I actually see that with even like, better hamburger restaurants these days as well that have simplified menus. And a good example of that is Mighty Fine, which I do know they definitely have in Dallas. Um, and Mighty Fine is really cool because uh, your order is actually in the same bag are on the same bag in which they put the food into. Um, and so on this, uh, on this bag, uh, you know, they, they put it down, it's upside down relative to you, and they ask you what you want. So you want a cheeseburger, um, what kind of condiments you want, <laughs> red, yellow, or white. Um, I'm a yellower person myself. 
Uh, and then um, they ask you if you want fries and what toppings you want. So based on that, they decide how that bag should flow through the rest of the process. So if you don't circle French fries, little FF there, that bag does not go to the French fry station. So based on your order at the very beginning, they're able to determine the exact set of steps that need to happen in order for this order to be fulfilled. The other interesting thing about this uh, is that the, the order is the bag itself. And so what they're doing is they're passing this bag from step to step to step. They never have to actually talk to anyone behind the scenes in order to get stuff done. All they're doing is just passing this bag from step to step to step. So this kind of message flow in which I know up front, these are the steps that need to happen. And I can determine up front uh, exactly where it needs to go um, and include that information on the message itself. This is known as a routing slip. A routing slip is a pattern in which I have a message that contains the information about what work to do. And it also includes the steps in which to pass the message from place to place to place. So in this case, when I take the order, I know these are the three steps that need to happen for this order. Perhaps with a different order, I don't need to do one of these steps, so I can leave that step out of the overall process. And this kind of, uh, this kind of approach uh, was, was actually done in manufacturing facilities uh, over the past you know, 150, 200 years, in which you'd have a packing slip or an order slip that said, these are the things, these are the stations this order needs to go to. And so as each step processes the order, they don't have to look at the order to figure out like, where should this, how should this be uh, built next? They don't do that. Instead, they just look at what is the next step in the process and that next step then can figure out what to do with it at that point in time. And so you just have to be able to figure out the steps up front to be able to know how to pass it on to subsequent steps. So uh, in this case, by sending it to um, each individual step in the process, no one's really coordinating with each other. All they're doing is passing the message from step to step to step. Or in the case of like Mindifying, they're just passing the bag from station to station to station until finally the last step is done. They put it on the grill or put it on the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the counter and they'll go deliver that food to you. So in this case, um, each individual step has their own queue for work. So the queue is just a, in, in the real world, is just a, an area where they keep all the different messages whatever those might be, that, des that describe here's what the order needs, to, uh, here's are the orders and here's what the order uh, information is. And the way that manifests in different restaurants looks different. So in Mighty Fine, it's a bag. And other restaurants that may have a till, and other ones that have like a little clips they put on the top and they slide these pieces of paper down these little clips. Um, which Witch has cues via a steel cable that they tie at the top of the restaurant and they'll sling your bag down as it goes from step to step to step. And it's a natural cue. Um, everything is first in, first out. No, last in, first out. No first, oh, whatever it is, it's a cue. And it goes from step to step to step, uh, taken in the order in which it was received. Um, now by working this way, we don't have to have a lot of verbal communication between each step in the process. So by having this asynchronous way of communicating, they don't have to worry about the uptime and availability of each individual person or step in the process. So I remove any kind of temporal coupling that one person talking to another one, the other person has to stop what they're doing, pay attention and listen, otherwise they'll lose the message. By using these asynchronous durable messages, I remove any of the temporal coupling between each step of the process. I can place a message on the next person's queue without them even knowing or caring or paying attention whatsoever. And uh, with this manner, we still have independence between each individual step. So each step can decide how to process their messages if they want to do them in batches or uh, look at the messages and figure out the, like that's 100% up to each step in the process how they decide to perform their work. Now, for a simple restaurant, this is easy, right? If I just have very simple menu items and very simple processes, I can get away with using something as simple as a routing slip in order to process uh, process my orders and, and get things done. But in modern e-commerce systems, in modern business systems, you can't just have like a very simple step-by-step -step process. Um, it usually gets way more complicated in terms of how work needs to get done in order to fulfill some more, uh, some kind of business transaction. So I wanted to uh, turn it up to 11, as you will, and look to see, well, what do larger chains do? How, do? how does someone like McDonald's, a modern like fast food restaurant, 
Um, how are they able to handle this kind of operation? Now, McDonald's today is much different than the McDonald's of, I don't know, the 50s or 60s, whenever it started out, uh, because they have much more complex menus and much more complex processes, in which we have a lot of different steps that now are, are not dependent on each other. So in, a, in our previous food truck, I could not, I could not reorder my steps. I could not do them in parallel. I had to do them in a very specific order. And now this case with the McDonald's, like you can do a lot of things in parallel. You don't have to like wait for the burger to be done to make your drink. You can make a drink and make the burger at the same time. But some aren't wholly independent. Sometimes you do have to do one step before the other. So sometimes someone orders a burger, but sometimes someone orders something like chicken strips on a sandwich. Well, you have to fry them first and then put them on the sandwich. Now you have this dependency between those two things. The steps can also vary per order. Uh, we may not have the exact set of, some same set of steps, and we cannot have the same set of menu items for every single person that comes in the door. So now at this point, like how do we manage now a much more complex ordering system than we had before? So I wanted to take these step by step and just walk through, because I actually worked, uh, <laughs> I worked at Whataburger in high school. Um, so I do have some experience, I guess, uh, with these kinds of systems. Uh, and I wanted to see like, based on this more complex arrangement, how can we coordinate the activities to be able to still have high throughput, high set of high number of orders we take at a time? Well, the first interaction is almost certainly still going to be a synchronous interaction because I really want to optimize the number of orders I can take per hour. Because the number of orders I can take per hour equals number um, <laughs> how much money I can take from you per hour as well. Because once you've given me your money, you're much less likely to ask for a refund because the grill is too slow or something like that. Um, so I really want to optimize and like getting your money as quickly as possible. So I'll still have that synchronous interaction in my restaurant. So someone comes in, they want to order something. Um, we're going to have a synchronous interaction and operation to be able to take your order information. So right now, everything looks exactly the same. Now that I got your information, though, what happens from here? How do I manage now the back-end process of being able to process your order? Now, a synchronous operation would be completely untenable. Um, and I've seen people try this with microservices. They're like, I don't know, someone somewhere, some architect, not me, uh, says, you know, Jeff Bezos said everything must be an API. So everything in our system is going to be an API. So everything has to talk to each other synchronously. But in the real world, that's like impossible. You cannot have a complex operation like this in which every single interaction is synchronous. This is a business that would not last very long if everyone had to talk to everybody else in order to get something done. It just wouldn't work very well. I couldn't go for the simple routing slip anymore because that's just too inefficient. Um, having this, this person at the front like, oh my God, um, <laughs> someone ordered like three cheeseburgers, when they order this, they're like, uh, how do I figure out the steps that need to happen? That's too much to put on top of, you know, the minimum wage person at the beginning who was just there to take orders uh, and really nothing else. Our solution here, when things are not as simple as a writing slip, not as simple as just a, 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 a two-way interaction, is to now use a conversation pattern. So how does this work in the real life? In the real life, we'd use um, a publish step to notify all of the stations that an order has come in. And typically, we'd only notify the stations that actually need to participate in this order. So the individual stations, if they don't perform a step, they just ignore that message and it never shows up. So in this case, I could publish a message saying, order's been created, and then inside of that uh, order, I would say, and here's the order details to be able to um, finish the order. And then, after that person lets everyone know, like an order is ready, that person goes to the counter next to the cash register and puts a tray down. And that tray is there to track the completion of the order. So the physical tray holds all the items for the order, but it also shows a receipt on that tray with the details of that order. And the receipt is not exactly the same as the receipt you get back of the customer. The receipt on the tray is just there to track completion of that order and nothing else. It's, it's a whole purpose in life. So how does this then get coordinated from each individual step? So let's say that the dressed step is done. Um, that person goes to the tray, they place the item on the tray, and then they check the items on the receipt for doneness. That is, um, based on the thing I just put on the tray, let me check it against the list of items that it said needed to have on there, and let's compare the two. 
our everything that was detailed on the receipt on the tray. No, they're not. So not done. Let me go back and keep doing more work. The next person uh, continues as well. They complete their item. They put it on top of the tray. They check to see if it's done. It's not done yet. So they go back and do more work. Finally, we have the fire person. They put the item on the tray. They check the items on the receipt for doneness. Ha ha, everything is on the tray. So let's ship it. Everything's good to go. So this kind of interaction where it starts off with an event, publishing an event, notifying many systems and services that work has, uh, that some event has occurred and now you can commit some sort of work. Um, this is known as choreography. So in a choreography conversation, it's an event-based initiation. The events notify many systems and services. And in this case, I can't enforce or know the order in which things actually occur when they, when they get processed, nor when they complete. So the people coming back from the restaurant, on this picture I had the dress grill fryer person completing that order, but it could have been fryer dress grill, and fire grill dress, grill dress fryer drinks, grill fryer, like you don't really guarantee about the order in which these different steps could complete. So in that case, I need to track what's done because I, I'm not the one that's exactly keeping, um, I'm, not, I'm not directing exactly which steps to go next. So because I cannot guarantee the order in which steps are processed or received, then I need to have something that keeps track of what's done. I also kind of think of this as an observer because they're observing events from other systems and services to be able to get things done. Uh, the microservices literature calls this choreography. Um, I'm not into dancing, so I guess that's what happens in choreography. People got to spin doing the thing, I guess. <clears throat> so in this picture though, it is a bit more complicated. We're putting a lot on the shoulders of each individual person coming up to the tray to look to see if it's done. So I do have that kind of extra overhead of that receipt of checking to see when things are done and I'm putting a lot on the shoulders of the people coming up. So in some restaurants, you actually have someone else that is taking done items from each of the stations, taking them over to the tray, and they're then checking those items to see if they're done. Uh, in the SOA world, this would be called a process manager. The process manager implementing a choreography pattern to be able to keep track of which things are done and being able to, and being notified of the different events going on in order to determine when the item is done and they can be shipped to the end customer. So we still don't have to worry about though, how do we deliver this tray to the end user? We need some way to correlate the orders and the trays with the humans, the people coming in. And there's two main ways that restaurants deal with this. Uh, in the Starbucks example, when you go to Starbucks or most coffee shops, um, I guess they want to be personal or whatever, uh, they'll ask you your name and they'll write your name on your cup. And when the order is complete, they will call your name out, um, butcher it probably, and then you will get your order. But that is a problem with a natural correlation identifier is that because I'm putting the correlation identifier really in the hands of the person coming to the door, then it has a higher likelihood that you got collisions in your uh, your your correlation identifier and then collisions in your orders as well. So if I go up to Starbucks and I say, yes, I want a half whip, half soy mocha frappuccino with extra chocolate shavings on top. And another Jimmy comes in right behind me and orders the same thing. Like, well, whose frappuccino is whose? I guess in real life, we would just be like, you know, haha, we both get the same thing and that, and that ironic. And we both get our frappuccinos. But uh, in the virtual world, we, we do kind of care about whose order is whose. So in the, in the virtual world and uh, in more high throughput restaurants, um, they're much more likely to use an artificial correlation identifier. In this case, you get a number. In McDonald's, your number is printed on your receipt. And so they'll tell you like your order number's on your receipt, okay. In Whataburger, you get that little like plastic tray thing. Um, in some restaurants, you get a little, like, little number to hang on a little hanging thing. Um, but what they're doing is they're giving you a unique number that means nothing to you or to anybody else, really. And it's just a way to correlate this overall business transaction. So just to sum up, choreography, event-based. We often have a central process manager who's kind of shuttling the message back and forth. But we're using that receipt to keep track of what is done because nothing's actually enforcing the order of how things happen. Now, in McDonald's case, 
they're really optimizing for throughput of orders per hour. So, right, it's called fast food. Although, what is it called now? It's like fast casual or something. I don't know. They have like a, a less uh, stigma version of that term these days. Um, but their, their whole thing is like, get you in and out as quickly as possible. And that's really never going to change. Like, once you sit down, you're not, you're not spending any more money. So you're just taking up space. that <laughs> Someone else could be sitting in that spot and eating their, you know, double Big Mac uh, with bacon or whatever. Um, so if I look at other kinds of restaurants that don't optimize for number of orders per hour, um, those restaurants, like a sit down kind of restaurants, what they're optimizing for is dollar per visit. So if you come and you spend two hours there, they want to maximize the amount of money you spend in that period of time. So that means that it's not just like one order and you're done. Instead, you have many interactions with the wait staff to have several opportunities to order something. So you often have like, well, you come in, you get drinks, then you get apps, then you get the main course, then you get dessert, then you get like, you know, after dinner drinks, and then it's shots. And then, uh, so they're trying to like, if you're going to spend two hours there, three hours there, that they want to, they want to get the most out of you for that time. Um, and in that case, the orders are going to be much more complex in this kind of operation. Uh, a lot of times, too, timing matters. So if I have a, you know, a group of people that are ordering together, we don't want the food to come out at different times. Um, there's ways for us to buffer it, like under the, heat, the heating lamp or whatever. Um, but we don't want to have a big disparity in when the times of things are cooked, especially if something is complicated to make. You want to say, well, when the steak is done, you want to have the melted butter right on top. But if the steak is done and the butter's not melted, and you're like, well, the steak is going to cool. By the time you put them at the butter, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's ruined. It's, it's no good anymore. So there could be a lot of coordination of individual uh, orders. Um, so I need to have a lot more control of the process. And so in these kinds of restaurants, you don't have this kind of choreography where each individual step can just kind of manage their own thing. And they're just, you know, taking orders off the board and just processing the order. Instead, you have like this benevolent, benevolent dictator. Um, the, the head chef, who is really the one that is dictating exactly when things should happen and in which order. So in this case, the chef, this benevolent dictator, they're the, really the person that is directing exactly when each step should occur and exactly what order things can, can occur. So in this game, they, the chef will receive the orders from the white staff, so the orders come in. Um, they'll create a plan in their head for how to complete this order, and then they kind of bark orders at people at specific points in time to be able to get them done. So they may actually even control when people actually get the information about individual orders. They may see like, I'm getting slammed for this thing, so let's go to the fryer and have them do these things first. Or I got a bunch of people wanting drinks, let's go ahead and let the, uh, let the bar know that they need to get those drinks out ASAP. But it all of course starts with our initial interaction with the order, uh, with the wait staff. So in this case, it's still going to be a synchronous interaction. I'm going to tell the wait staff, here are the items I want. So I'll say, go ahead and add the burger to my order. Okay, got it. Uh, add some fries to my order. Okay, got it. Uh, adds, add a drink to my order. Yep, I got that. Okay. Um, is everything okay? Yep. Okay, we'll go ahead and say, now finish the order. I'm going to notify, <laughs> notify the chef um, that my order is now ready to be processed. So that lets, the, lets the chef know um, that, okay, now the order is ready to be processed, and here's the information about the order. So this. Um, this kind of interaction is often started by a single message as opposed to a published message where I have multiple messages coming at the one time. So the chef, because he's just listening to that one channel, that's what triggers that person to be able to start now the rest of the process in the back end. So they receive the order, they make that plan to figure out exactly what the order of things need, that need to happen, and they start barking at those orders to get things done. They know burger's going to take a while, so let's go ahead and say, okay, go ahead and and uh, start making that burger. So he yells at the burger person, go ahead and make that order. Um, we need to get that drink out though. So let's go ahead and tell the bar to go ahead and uh, make the person the drink. Um, I get notified that the drink was complete. And so now I can go in to the wait stop and say, go ahead and deliver this pint to that person. And you often see like a, a little area at the front where they'll have a tray that has, here's all the different drinks people have ordered. And then under each drink will have a coordination identifier correlation identifier that says whose drink this is, what table that is, needs to go to. So then they start barking out more orders. Okay, fire, you need to make some fries for this one order. 
And we waited a little bit because fries take less amount of time. So we wanted to get the grilled the burger first before we started the fryer. So we waited a little bit to tell the fryer to do the work. At this point, the completion messages just start rolling in saying, okay, the burger's complete, everything's good to go there. Uh, the fries are complete, everything's good to go there. So now I need to send a message to the wait staff to say, okay, everything's ready. Now it's time to deliver this order. So what, is this, what does this look like? Um, this pattern is known as orchestration. In orchestration, the process is typically started off, typically it started off by a single initial message. That's like the first domino that needs to fall. And from there, we're using commands to coordinate other activities. We're telling each step exactly what to do and when. And we use a request response pattern to indicate completion. So I, I tell the grill person to do the work and they reply back to me when that work is done. They're not publishing an event. Hello, restaurants, guess what? Burger completed. I don't know who needs to know, but whoever's listening and needs to know, go do your stuff now. Like, no, they, they respond back to the person that told them to do the work to let them know, this is done. Uh, now you can go take your burger and do whatever you want to it. So in this picture and orchestration, um, there's a much less need to track any status of anything that we're doing because the request response pattern includes the kind of tracking information as part of it. When I tell grill person, make order 23, they come back to me and say, order 23 complete. Well, okay, I, I know that because I already told them to, to do the order, so I don't have to keep track of like what has done what. I'm just waiting to hear back from all the commands I've issued out. I'm waiting for the res those responses to be able to go on to the next step. So when would I choose <laughs> these two different patterns? Because in the real world, we do see both of these patterns being used. Well, in order to, to really dig down to understand which is more desirable in a specific scenario, we have to analyze the overall process flow and the coupling between each individual step. If one step like always happen to, has to happen after another step, and they, there's like a natural um, cohesion between those two steps, uh, then it could be that I, I need to go more towards orchestration, in which I'm, ex I'm or I'm, I'm, where I'm explicitly saying these are the steps that need to happen in which specific order. So for that, I see orchestration typically being used inside of service boundaries. For a microservice to be autonomous, then it needs to be able to handle and manage its own work, its own information, and its own data. Um, and so if I have a microservice that is just being told what to do all the time, just like in the real life, they're, they're not happy with things and they're not that autonomous. So in this picture of our, our restaurant, these, these aren't autonomous um, stations. They can't just do their other thing whenever they want. They're being told what to do all the time. So if I look at this picture, I would actually say my service boundary is not each station. My service boundary is actually the larger orange box, which is the, the restaurant. That's my, that's my service that I'm providing here. Um, choreography is something I usually use between service boundaries. Because I'm typically doing events between services, and that usually means that I can't guarantee the order in which those events are processed or, um, processed or, or uh, published. And so choreography has to listen in into these events, which may arrive in, in different orders and keep track of the things that's received before going on to the next step. Now it could be a mix of these two. You could have a complex process that starts out with commands, that does request response, then it needs to have stuff done by other people, so it publishes an event, and then listens back and waits for those events, uh, those, those corresponding done events to come back before moving on with this next step in the process. But for the most part, my processes tend to fall between these two conversation patterns of orchestration and choreography. Now for this point, uh, up to this point, we've really been talking about the order taking process. Um, but what about our reads? What about all that stuff that has to happen before the customer actually places the order? Um, and so this has a, has a very um, similar analog to the real world as well. And the, the analog there is going to be a menu. A menu is the end result of my business deciding exactly what to sell, how to present it, what prices to, to have people, when to take things off, when to put things on. Um, that's the sum total of all those decisions get put on top of that menu. Now, we want to ensure that people can make a quick decision about what to order. So we want to make sure that reading the menu is very low, <laughs> is low resource intensive. So like the only cost to menu after I print it is just like, the cost of light, like shining on the thing 
and I'll read the thing. Like that's the, that's the entire cost of me reading the order. The menu as well is built for a specific purpose in mind. The menu is built for customers and nobody else. Um, but we want to make sure that the decisions on building the menu are not visible to the customers. So they don't need to know, you know, how the sausage was made or the sausage menu was made. Sure. Um, they don't need to know all that. They just need to know um, the end result, the final, the final package that they're getting about how everything came, came together. So it could be like one person, it could have been 10 people, it could have been a whole, you know, departments of people. But by the time the menu gets printed to the person and shown to that customer, then I need to make sure that all the back end madness that went into making the menu does not bleed through and leak through to that end user and confuse them. So in the real life, these restaurants may use, you know, Microsoft Office basically to create the menu. Um, so they've got, you know, spreadsheets and inventory and uh, pricing and, and all sorts of stuff to figure out, okay, how much do I charge for each of these different items? So these backend systems are really optimized for managing the menu and figuring out, you know, what to, what to charge people and how to present it, things like that. It has all the decisions and business rules as part of that. You know, calculations, reports, forecasts, historical trends, uh, lots of things going into um, being able to decide what the menu should look like. But most systems I see of like their typical, the typical um, architecture is I've got a front end and I've got a back end, two web applications uh, that are both talking the same way of representing the data. Um, and this is really equivalent to like, when someone wants to order something, I hand them uh, a link to an Excel spreadsheet. I'd be like, okay, <laughs> this doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, so I, I, I'm, in this case, I'm using the same model to solve two very different problems and heuristics of these different kinds of users. They have very different characteristics. And so really I'd like two different solutions. One solution for the end user, one solution for the backend management. So the better solution, this is just like, you know, mitosis, boom spit the database in two. And now I can have one database for the front end and one database for the back end. And the front end database is optimized for reads. The back end database is, I would say, I'm not optimized for writes, but it's optimized for business decisions instead. So, okay, you, you split the database. Um, the front end can now have a very different shape to it. It could even be different technologies, but now how do I manage the communication um, and integration between those two now different data stores? I know this, is, this is a lot of times when like DBAs freak out because like, oh no, we can't have this because now we have two sources of truth. But it's not really two sources of truth because I've got a front end that only reads from the information and the back end that writes it. So even though that, that data could be in two physical locations, I'm still preserving the ownership of the back end owning the data that is in you know, cache or whatever in the front end. So, um, how does, uh, how do each, each of these interactions look? Well, typically my menu is updated uh, on, a, on a scheduled basis. That is, it's not like always quote up to date. This is another challenge I run into with the business. Like they want that with, as soon as they make a decision, that decision like immediately is, no, is, is, uh, is represented on the you know, user facing site. But that can be pr uh, pretty confusing for users. Like I'm on an e-commerce site and I click a link and then I click back and the price changed. That's not a very good experience. <laughs> Maybe it went down, sure. Uh, but if it went up, I'm like, uh-oh, uh, this is freaking me out. Are they gonna change the prices again? So oftentimes you'll have a different kind of uh, cadence in which the information you're showing to the end user is changed versus how much the information is changing in the back end. This don't have to be on the same exact schedule. Uh, the menu is also immutable. That is, once I, once I publish the prices, notify the new menu to the restaurant, they can't be like, I don't like that. I don't like that price or I don't like that item and just like cross it off. And certainly the customer can't do that. The customer can't be like, ooh, you know what, it'd be a better deal if you just knocked a zero off the end. Now that's much better price. So in this case, even though the data is duplicated, we're not allowing updates of that information from anything else than the owners of that information. So the data is duplicated, but the ownership is preserved. So if I wanna notify restaurants that I've got a menu update, I can use, again, an asynchronous form of communication in order to do so. So I'm gonna publish an event saying, hey, menu's been updated. Uh, here's all the different menu items and here's all the different prices. And then if I have multiple different restaurants or stores that are um, 
are a part of my chain of restaurants, then each one of those is now subscribing to my menu updates. So the publisher um, kind of keeps track of who's subscribed to what and where that is, where that subscription is located. It could depend on the technology. Um, it could depend, it could be like the publisher themselves can keep track of it. Or if they're using a third party, like a, a message broker, it could be inside that as well. Um, the message is gonna be a durable message. And this is just to ensure like, if I'm the owner of the store and I got 10 stores, I don't want the phone 10 stores to let them know the menu's updated. Um, that could take a big chunk of my day. Instead, what I like to do is write an email and BCC 10 stores, send it once, and that email then gets sent out to all those different stores. Publishing as well uh, creates an individual message per subscriber. So each store gets their own copy of the message. What that means is uh, if one of the stores is down or unavailable, it doesn't affect anybody else. So a durable message is sent to subscribers. The subscribers are wholly unaware of each other because they use BCC, I guess. Um, and so they're not really, they don't really care or, or have any knowledge of like this store got it before me or got it after me or their store, you know, didn't put their mini up right. It doesn't affect anybody else. I'm, I'm the single subscriber. I get my copy of the message that I could decide exactly how to process and then make my updates to my menu um, on the timing that makes sense for me. So if one of the stores goes out of business, however, like a message cannot be delivered for whatever reason, because each subscriber gets their own copy of the message, then one subscriber being down does not affect one, the publisher's ability to publish messages or any of the subscribers ability to handle those messages um, completely independently. You know, there's uh, anyone else that could be down. So, some parting thoughts of microservice messaging, uh, communication and conversation patterns. When we're thinking about these systems, uh, it's really important to imagine them and think of them uh, in their real world counterparts using that metaphor because uh, the systems we're building, even though they're virtual and things are fast, they're still under the same constraints that the real world has. That is communication is an instant um, and, other, and the other side can be down. The only thing that's happened is the latency has gotten shorter. That's not zero. So if I'm able to design in a metaphor that makes sense in the real world, I have a much higher likelihood of success in the virtual world. And that's what, that's what I found. Um, you know, walking around, seeing how businesses conduct themselves, the ones that actually run well and aren't chaotic, um, I can look at you know, how are they conducting business, how are they organizing the work, how are they communicating, and look for those same patterns to apply to the systems and, and, and uh, architectures that I'm working with. The real world has solved a lot of these distribution problems with messaging and conversation coordination, and it hasn't required everything to be like a synchronous transaction in order to get it to work. The real world is much messier than we, we probably hope, um, but it's able to handle failures and miscommunications and, and things not being quite understood and things having to go through a different route. Uh, the real world was able to, is able to handle those things, and, and we can too if we just design our systems in a similar kind of manner to how, how actual asynchronous work uh, works in the real world. So that was effective microservice communication and conversation patterns. If you want to learn more about this, there are some great resources out there. Uh, one of my favorites is the Enterprise Integration Patterns book. Um, it's by Gregor Hope. Uh, you can look for his website, gregorhope.com, or eippatterns.com. Fantastic book. So it walks through a lot of like the, the very, uh, um, the main like kind of single message patterns we talked about today. Um, he also has a book coming out that talks about conversation patterns that walks into the more complex interactions we can have. Not out yet, but you can go to his website and it's also on there as well. Uh, some other great resources, um, microservices.io describes a lot of these patterns as well. Um, the SOA patterns book from, I don't know how to pronounce his name, uh, Arnon something. And um, of course, the microservices book that describes some of these patterns as well. Um, so thank you all very much. Um, we do have to have some times for questions. Um, otherwise, thank you all very much for attending today. So I'll go a couple questions here. Um, one question was, any example of what a quote broker is? So I have, clear, I have a clear idea. So I, let's see, what time was that? 641. So yeah, I was talking about the bad brokers. <laughs> So the, um, what I'm really thinking of is, are, are those, are those really big, expensive brokers, the Tipco's, the biz talks of the world, these ones, they wanted you like, you're going to do service-oriented architecture, great. 
then you're going to go buy some big thing, deploy it into some central thing. And then now instead of you coding, you're really configuring this central broker to do all this work. Um, so those are the things that try to take all the SOA patterns and just be like, we'll just make these XML. And then, you know, there you go. Just, you know, just enough XML configuration and you'll be good to go. Um, so microservices was trying to swing the pendulum the other way. It says, instead of having smart pipes and dumb endpoints, we'll flip that and have smart endpoints and dumb pipes. Put all the smarts in our systems and applications. And then the, the thing shuttling messages and communications back and forth should be just really dumb as possible and not really know what's actually going on behind the scenes. All right, what else do I got? Um, Lots of praise. I'm going to skip any kind of complaints. And all right, Ox says often see messaging as something that never gets implemented or has come late to the game. Do you have any strategies or suggestions for people looking to add messaging to an app that is mostly stateless and synchronous with the data, typically monolith, everything done with REST? Um, so I, you probably do have asynchronous work going on. Um, because there is going to be some time where like you can't get all the work done in the click of the button. And so what you've got instead is like a table with an is process flag or a batch ID flag. And then you have like some process in the back end that like wakes up at midnight to do a bunch of batch processing and then goes back to sleep again. So those are the cases that I would really look towards first as a way of introducing messaging. Because the way I typically approach it is like, well, we've already got a queue, but we're just processing the messages in batch. So instead of doing that, how about we just, you know, when work's needed to be done, we send a message and it gets done right away as opposed to waiting to some specific point in time. Um, so I find it's just a, a way for us to remove a lot of infrastructure code that we wrote ourselves and just use something that is a bit more natural fit. Now past that, it is much more challenging because a lot of times there will be a re-architecture of your system or not a rewrite, but you'll have to rejigger how things work if everything is synchronous because it is a big deal to go from everything is synchronous and available right away versus I have a more uh, model of I'm asking you to do something. You're not doing it right away. You're doing it sometime in the future. So that often needs even UX changes to be able to support those kinds of operations. Um, and so I just look for those opportunities to say, maybe we have some processes that fail often. And so maybe we can go to a different interaction model that allows us to do this offline. And so what we're doing is doing something like the restaurant pattern where you don't have your food delivered to you right away. Instead, I'm giving you a number and you're coming back later to be able to see when the thing is done. So in terms of business side, I put that in terms of um, we're gonna have a lot more uh, likelihood of success. We're gonna get a lot more orders in the door. Um, the trade-off is we have to convince our customers that it's okay to not have everything done by the time they click that button. All right. Um, so another question is, am I right in thinking choreography is analogous to the boss worker pattern and orchestration is analogous to a pipeline? Not exactly because uh, orchestration may or may not be just like a, a pipeline of work that needs to be done. Um, actually, those were backwards because, yep, no, choreography is event-based. So it's not necessarily like a boss worker pattern. Um, instead, it could be a little bit more loosely coupled where something like, um, you know, the canonical example I use is like, I cannot ship the order until I validated the address and I validated the credit card information and I validated the order details. So those three things are independent of each other. So once those three things come back to me and tell me they're done, then I can go ahead and ship the order. I'm not like, I'm not directing their work. I'm not the boss of them they're doing their own work independent of me and even managing their own process, like credit card failed, put a hold on it, call the customer to get it resolved. I don't know what's going on there. I just like, I just need to be notified. Tell me when it's good, and then I can go off my work. All right, let's see what else I got. Um, what kind of design strategy should I follow when my workflow is a series of consecutive steps and possibly some of the steps can fail? Um, so it could be, It could be easy to say, let's just go for the routing slip. But routing slip is actually more difficult to recover from failures and say, when this step fails, then do this alternate set of, uh, alternate set of steps. Um, so in that case, you could look at something like the saga pattern. A saga pattern is a series of forward uh, transactions and a series of compensating actions in case something goes wrong. So if, it, if you have a kind of a very simple like, 
forward set of steps and reverse set of steps, that could be something as well. Um, otherwise, it starts to become just like, it's just a process manager. It's using messaging to be able to coordinate activities. And I got to decide like what messages I send to who in order to get this work done. If I'm using commands all over the place and it's introducing process coupling because I'm saying exactly what needs to happen when. So in the case of um, services I don't own, I may look for events to be able to do so. But um, if it's just like consecutive steps that some steps can possibly fail, uh, I still just use process manager. And then the response back from each individual step will tell me pass or fail. And then I can decide what to do next. What technology do you use to implement commands? I'm familiar with events, which is supported by RabbitMQ, Kafka, Azure Service Bus as well. Okay, um, so commands and events are just general uh, or, or specific patterns of messaging. Um, so with each of those, uh, each of those things, it's, it all just comes down to there's a message in a queue. Um, the real difference between an event and a command is a command is sent to a specific listener. Like I, I'm telling you to do some work. I'm not telling, you know, the world, I'm not like standing on the street corner telling like repent or whatever. Um, I'm telling a specific service and a specific endpoint to do specific work. So in that case, um, instead of using like Azure Service Bus as a concept of, uh, what do they call those, exchanges? Or is that RabbitMQ? Um, where you have these like fan out properties. Instead, what you'll typically do for there is um, either send directly to the queue, to the endpoint that's doing the work, or you're sending to the, end, the exchange that is connected directly to the queue, to the endpoint doing the work. I often use like endpoints associated routings, like messaging endpoints have their own specific queues they're listening to. And they don't have multiple endpoints looking at a single queue, like fighting over the work. And instead it's like a single logical endpoint owns a specific queue. So if I want to tell that endpoint to do work through a command, I send a message to that individual queue. The brokers you listed there actually don't know what events are. They just support publish patterns, like fan out patterns. Opaba has had the same question, yes. Um, yeah, so it's just uh, all those different brokers are just kind of messaging brokers. And then they'll often have clients on top of them to be able to put these uh, more complex communication patterns. It's like RabbitMQ, for example. Um, RabbitMQ doesn't have the concept of commands or events. It has the concept of exchanges and fan out queues, but those aren't really events. I can fan out any message I want. I can have my cat type on the keyboard and it can fan out a message to all those different um, all those different uh, queues. So it's really up to our kind of client APIs on top of that to enforce these semantics of commands and events. And so I just use libraries to do that. Um, depending on like what platform you're building on top of, those libraries will be different. If you're in .NET world, like the top ones are gonna be in-service bus, um, let's see, in-service bus, mass transit and rebus are the most popular ones. You can use like the bare, uh, the bare clients, but I don't recommend that because they don't have these concepts of events and commands and request response. You just don't have those same kinds of things built, built in. Java world, those exist as well. So like Spring has an excellent library for dealing with these kind of messaging primitives as well. So I just like, don't use the clients directly, use the thing on top of the clients that talks about things in terms of messaging patterns. Uh, is the asynchronous, okay, be, let's be the last question, by the way. Is the asynchronous aspect of all this by design and behavior how things lay and not necessarily that you code specific methods as async? Yes, so I was purposely ignoring the async await um, problem or confusion uh, because async await is a way for the thread to just pause for a second while another like, you know, lower IO thread is able to take and do the work and then wake back up and get whatever. But the end user is still blocking and waiting. So yes, I can use a modern web app, you know, web server. It uses async await, but all that does is increase throughput. Me as the person using the website, I'm still staring at, you know, a fancy spinner GIF waiting for the response to come back. So for me, it's still synchronous. And that's really what counts. Yes, it could be async on the back end, but I, the end user, are synchronous. With async messaging though, I am only synchronous at the point of sending a message and receiving an acknowledgement that the messaging system has received my message. So in the real life, what this looks like, like you sending an async message is synchronous only for you typing the message and clicking send. When you click send, like, okay, now you can do the other things, but you don't, you don't know or care like when the other person receives a message or they align, whatever, like you're, you're synchronous 
um, step is just composing and sending. That's it. All right, thank you everyone. If you have more questions, comments, concerns, um, hit me up on my Twitter. That's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. You can, my DMs are open, so you can DM me there. Otherwise, I hope you all have a great evening, and I hope my dog didn't bark too much in the background. This is his walking time, so he gets super excited. Um, so yeah, I hope you have a great evening, and uh, have a great rest of the week. Thank you all. Awesome. Well, thank you for uh, coming and talking with us, Jimmy. It was great.